Hello and welcome to this session where I'll be talking about uh, how to build the next generation OLAP stack using Apache Pino. Hi, I'm Chinmay Soman. I'm a founding engineer in Startree, which is a company around Apache Pino. Uh, previously, I led the streaming platform team at Uber, uh, and I'm also part of projects like Pino, Samza, and Voldemort. Um, today, I'll be talking about how the requirements of OLAP and real-time analytics uh, have changed over the years and what an ideal OLAP engine should look like. And next, I'll give a, a quick intro to Apache Pino and go through its architectural overview. And in the second half of the presentation, we'll deep dive into some of the salient aspects of Pino that make it the perfect fit uh, as the ideal OLAP engine. So OLAP or online analytical processing is really the thing that powers real-time analytics. Uh, and the requirements of real-time analytics has been rapidly changing over the years. Uh, these are some of the trends we are seeing in the industry today. Uh, and let's go through it one by one. In the beginning, uh, OLAP use cases were mostly limited to building dashboards like, like this that you see on the left where you're trying to present your system metrics or business metrics uh, to a handful of internal users. So in this case, the query latency was expected to be within seconds. Uh, data had to be fresh, but could be seconds to minutes delayed. And the concurrency was typically low uh, because only tens to hundreds of users would interact with these dashboards on a very infrequent basis. But now, uh, OLAP has gone much more mainstream uh, and companies like Uber are exposing this capability directly to their customers and end users. Uh, so this is an example of the restaurant manager dashboard that's given to about a million restaurant owners across the globe. And every time they open the dashboard, they get insights into the real-time orders or missed orders or week over week sales metrics and, and so on. About 100 million Uber Eats users, uh, every time they open their app, they can see insights into the popular orders happening in their neighborhood uh, in real time. And similarly, more than 700 million LinkedIn members, every time they visit the LinkedIn homepage, uh, the newsfeed gets optimized based on their viewing history. All of these are examples of what we call as user-facing analytics. And the requirements in this case are much more stringent. So the query latency has to be really fast uh, within milliseconds uh, or it's going to be a bad user experience. Uh, data has to be as fresh as possible. So we want to be able to query as soon as the data is, is generated. And, and the concurrency is uh, very high because millions of users would be interacting with products like these on a constant basis. Now let's talk about the data consistency. Uh, the traditional OLAP systems were designed to be append only, and it was okay to do best effort queries on the incoming data. Uh, so the input streams could contain uh, in duplicates or uh, updates or deletes, uh, and, and the queries would be off by a little bit. For example, it could double count some of the duplicate values. And this was okay, most uh, on account of the use cases that were being built at the time. But some of the modern OLAP use cases demand the ability to do accurate queries. Um, in other words, the OLAP engine must be able to reconcile any data mutation, like inserts or updates uh, happening on the real-time input stream. This is an example, again, from Uber where the internal operators um, get to slice and dice the Uber Eats orders based on the latest status of the order. And of course, the latest status keeps, keeps changing. Um, so this allows the operators to, give, to get the latest view and then react accordingly for each order, which is very important. Uh, another big issue is uh, how to handle semi-structured data. Um, uh, in, in the old days, engineers were okay to run uh, complex pre-processing pipelines to convert the semi-structured data into a structured format and, and then ingest into the OLAP engine. Uh, 
nowadays we see more and more people demand <clears throat> that this should be handled out of the box in in the olap engine and there's two main reasons for this uh, one is obviously the pre processing pipelines are quite complex and expensive to maintain and they also introduce failure points in in, in the system and then the second is the user persona interacting with olap has uh, expanded from just engineers to also data scientists or execs or pms uh, starting to use olap directly uh, so for this user persona it's important um, that ingesting such semi structured data is as easy as possible on a similar line uh, we have uh, the in the old days uh, the sql semantics were simpler uh, olap queries were mostly limited to doing aggregations and and order by and group by uh, but now we see uh, again more and more people demand ability to do full sql semantics which includes um, joins and nested queries and so on again this this refers to the fact that the more more kind of people are using olap and more powerful use cases are being built using olap the next one might be intuitive um in, in in a few years back olap systems were expected to handle data in the range of hundreds of gb to maybe a few terabytes uh, and at this scale it's okay to co-locate the data along with the compute on, on the olap data nodes but nowadays uh the olap systems are expected to handle very high scale of data from hundreds of terabytes to even petabytes of data and at this scale uh, it's no longer cost efficient to store everything locally uh, so what we need is a hybrid architecture where some of the important data can still be local uh, but most of the historical or less frequently queried data can be stored remotely on cheap cloud storage and finally the the number of use cases that are being built on olap have just exploded from uh, personalization to metrics to to root cause analysis and ad hoc real time exploration and log analytics and so on um, and as you can see in this table the requirements of each of this use case uh, varies quite a bit so for user facing analytics we need the ability to do extremely high throughput extremely low latency queries whereas we need very high query complexity uh, for ad hoc analytics uh, ideally we need we should have one olap system that can be used to that can be tuned to support all such uh, various use cases and and different requirements uh, that we saw before and we strongly believe that system is apache pino uh for those who haven't heard of pino it's a distributed uh, columnar database which can ingest from a wide variety of sources like streaming batch or sql uh, and make this data available to query in real time it was it was purpose built for user facing analytics uh, and in fact all of the screenshots that you saw in the previous slide have all be, been built on all those use cases have been built on pino uh so it's it's designed to handle very high throughput and extremely low latency analytical queries as of today it's a which it's, it's a mature technology and adopted by hundreds of companies across the globe uh, with prominent names like stripe uh, uber wepay 711 and so on some of the largest pino clusters can easily ingest um, millions of events per second um Uh, one of the biggest cluster can handle is handling more than two hundred thousand queries per second, while still maintaining uh, millisecond level P ninety nine latency. So let's take a quick detour and go through uh, how it looks like under the hood. Um, so when we talk about a Pino table, uh, it's composed of a a bunch of what we call as Pino segments. A Pino segment is a unit of uh, partitioning and replication within Pino, and it represents a, a chunk or a subset of the input data uh, organized in a columnar fashion, uh, along with any of the indexes that the user has specified uh, for that particular table. Uh, 
These segments are then distributed across uh, a bunch of Pino servers, uh, which are responsible for local query processing. We have a Pino controller, which dictates how the segments are assigned to the servers, how they're replicated, uh, how cluster membership is maintained and so on. And finally, we have the Pino broker, uh, which is responsible for query processing. Uh, so users or applications can send their queries to the broker uh, and it does a distributed scatter gather to generate the final result. So it'll, it'll push down query to individual servers Servers will do local query processing, return an intermediate result, and then the broker does a final aggregation and, and uh, sends it back to the user. All right, so back to the main topic. Why do we think Pino is a perfect candidate as a modern OLAP engine? Uh, so as I already mentioned, it's built for user-facing analytics. So it can easily handle the latency, freshness, and concurrency aspect that we discussed before. Um, Pino also has the ability to handle uh, any mutations happening in real time. So you could have uh, Kafka or Kinesis streams uh, and, and have stream updates uh, through, through, the, through that data source and Pino will reconcile that and give you the latest status in the queries. Thereby it, it generates accurate queries uh, whenever needed. Uh, it has excellent support to handle semi-structured data out of the box, um, which could be JSON or text format and, and so on. Um, recently, we uh, it, it, of, it of course supports all of the standard OLAP queries and recently we added the support to do uh, joins. Uh, and, and joins could be either a join between a fact and a dimension table uh, or a multi-state join where you're joining two fact tables in, in Pinot. And finally, uh, it, it has a pluggable architecture. So it, it's very easy to configure a Pinot cluster to store some of the data in, in a remote cloud storage and query that seamlessly. Um, so, so as you can see, all of these are compelling features uh, which uh, satisfy uh, most, if not all the requirements that we saw earlier. So in the next section, let's deep dive into some of these features to, to get to know them in more detail. Uh, starting with the, the speed of Pinot. Uh, so this is again the view of, uh, high level view of uh, how a broker does query processing. Uh, by default, the, the broker will try to process all of the available segments uh, for a given table to satisfy any incoming query. And this is obviously not efficient or, or very fast. So, Query optimization, in this case, uh, attempts to do pruning or, or in other words, discard the segments that are not relevant for the incoming query. And pruning happens at multiple levels. At the broker level, um, it, will, it will prune based on the segment metadata and, and only query a subset of the servers. At the server level, uh, it will further prune um, based on uh, additional heuristics, um, which reduces the overall work. And then finally, at a segment level, we have more optimizations that we can apply. So let's go through this one by one. So without pruning, uh, as I mentioned, broker will try to query all the available servers and each one will process all the segments. Um, so there are two ways to make this better. Um, one, your data could be uh, partitioned on time, which is the default uh, layout in, in Pino. In this case, when you get a query with a time range, something like this, um, the broker will look at the segment metadata uh, and then discard uh, the, the segments which don't fall in this time, in this time range, thereby only querying a subset of servers. Similarly, you could also partition the data on a particular dimension in your schema. Um, and when a query comes in, uh, for example, in this case, you're trying to do a count star on a user ID uh, filter. In this case, you can partition your data on user ID. And for a query like this, it will identify based on the value, which partition should I query. Uh, 
uh, again based on the segment on the segment metadata. Uh, this allows the broker to uh, narrow down on only one of the uh, partitions. Uh, in this case, it will only going to query one server out of four servers. So as you can see, this drastically reduces the scattergather overhead that the broker has to do. All right, so now let's look at what happens at the server level. Um, so now Pinot Broker is querying one server. Now the, that one server is going to further try to prune uh, the segments that it has to process. And for this, uh, Pinot supports uh, a bloom filter. So for example, uh, there's another query we're trying to do a count star on uh, a player ID dimension. In this case, you can define a bloom filter on player ID. Um, and this allows, so when the query comes in, the server uses this bloom filter to simply discard the segments that, are, that don't contain uh, this particular value. And, and therefore, the amount of work the server needs to do is further reduced. Now let's look at what happens within each segment uh, that the server has to process. As I mentioned, uh, a segment is a chunk or a subset of the data, which includes um, the data in a columnar format, which itself is pretty fast. Um, for example, when you get a query where you want to do a count star on a dimension like country, uh, in a column-based format, you only need to uh, scan the data for one column instead of the entire table. So it reduces how much work the CPU has to do and how much data we need to bring in in memory. In addition, what Pino allows you to do is configure different indexes per column. So for example, in this case, we define an inverted index on the country column. So instead of having to scan the data, we can simply look up values relevant for that query and, and compute the result. Pino has a, a variety of these indexes. Uh, which uh, can be used to do both filtering as well as aggregation optimization. Uh, so inverted index and sorted index can accelerate queries for equality predicates. As the name implies, range index can uh, speed up queries with range predicates, as we saw earlier. Uh, JSON index and text index uh, help in when, whenever semi-structured data is involved. We also have a geo index, uh, which, which can accelerate queries for, uh, uh, for doing things like uh, distance computation or point and polygon computation and so on. We have uh, Pino has support for theta sketches and hyperlog log that uh, accelerate processing for, for approximate queries. And finally, we also have the starter index which can optimize both filter and, and, and aggregation functions. So Startree is really uh, a special index which allows you to build materialized view in Pinot. Uh, so you can define an aggregation function uh, and the list of dimensions that are going to be used in the predicates. And it will go ahead and pre-aggregate uh, values for that function uh, for all possible combi or for a bunch of combinations on that dimension. So for queries, including that particular function and dimensions, it will, uh, in many cases, it results in a simple lookup of the value. But it is pretty smart. So it doesn't uh, pre-aggregate all possible values. Uh, it, it, it gives you the ability to tune how much should I pre-aggregate and how much should I scan, uh, which, which makes this overall very efficient. All of this combined, the broker pruning, server pruning, and, and the segment level optimizations, uh, this makes query processing in Pinot extremely powerful, uh, which in turn allows it to do extremely low latency queries and support, um, indirectly support high throughput as well. Next, uh, let's look at how upserts are being handled in, in Pinot. Uh, and given the distributed nature of Pinot, this is a, a big challenge. Um, and there are two main uh, assumptions in Pinot which make this even more, which makes upsert handling very complex. So the first is there is no global coordination amongst the Pinot servers um, when it comes to uh, the data ingestion or query processing. Uh, 
so for example if uh, the real time stream containing duplicates or, or updates uh, land on different servers as shown here s1 and s3 uh, there's no easy way to reconcile uh, the the latest value here and the second one is uh, pino segments are immutable so once a segment is generated you cannot go back and change any of the values which obviously makes upsert handling complex so when we are designing upserts we uh, decided to keep these assumptions because they provide a lot of simplicity to the overall architecture so how did we fix this uh, issue um, so one in, in this case the one assumption what we did is to to reduce the problem from a global coordination to a local coordination on a single server so the assumption we made here is that the incoming data can be partitioned on the primary key on which we want to do the upsets upset handling um with this uh, with this uh, architecture or with this assumption all records with the same primary key they uh, go in the same partition in the data source and eventually they end up on the same pino server um where it can locally reconcile these different updates Uh, the second thing uh, we did was to add an upsert coordinator at a cell level and it what it does is for each incoming record it maintains the upsert metadata uh, which is really a map of the primary key to its location within one of the segments or on uh, located on that server with this upsert metadata we can actually generate a bitmap per segment um which which really tells us which records within that segment are active and which are non active or have been upserted uh, at query processing we can use these bitmaps to quickly filter out the obsolete records and and only look at the latest status for each primary key uh, if you are interested to know more about this uh, i've linked the youtube video which is uh, which is uh, definitely a, a must watch All right so as of today upserts are being uh, the upsert mechanism is being used in production at uber and other companies um we, we it uh, we also support the ability to do partial upserts uh, as you can see here on the right you can define uh, the strategy for handling upserts at a, at an individual column level and this is very important if your input data source Uh, does not include the entire row and only has for example column updates in which case you can use partial upserts to materialize the entire row on pino uh, and finally we also made it easy to backfill data uh, for an upsert enabled pino table uh, which makes this a very uh, production ready feature to use all right now let's look at uh, the the hybrid architecture pino supports for uh, handling large scale of data so as you can this is the traditional pino architecture um, where the all the pino segments are hosted locally on the individual pino servers um, and when the query comes in they do local query execution uh, as you can imagine this allows us to maintain extremely low latency shown by the blue line here however um in this case the cost to serve uh, such queries increases linearly along with the data this is because we need more pino servers uh, if the data keeps growing um which is which is which can get expensive for very high volume of data so what we did is uh, we added a plugin to pino uh, so that it can uh, we can store segments pino segments on a remote storage something like s3 and still seamlessly be able to query that data so in this case when a query comes in uh, the pino servers uh, fetch some chunk or a subset of the segments locally and then do query processing uh, please note that in this case a lot of the optimizations we saw earlier are still applied in this architecture for example the the broker level pruning is still is still done since we only need the segment metadata 
the Pinot server level pruning can also be done uh, by caching uh, bloom filters locally. Uh, similarly, we could also cache uh, some of the other indexes locally and accelerate processing which don't really need scans. Uh, this allow this gives it uh, makes it using remote storage um, actually not not that slow. So this is one of the benchmarks we did uh, to prove this concept, um, where we are comparing late query latencies for a, a variety of these queries across three different architectures. In the tightly coupled architecture, this is the vanilla Pinot, where all the data is hosted locally. Uh, we then use another decoupled architecture where compute and storage are completely independent uh, and we use Presto uh, in this case to do the to, to generate the query latency and then the third one is the tiered storage is a new plugin that we built so as you can see the the query latency with tiered storage is uh, somewhat high as compared to tightly coupled but is significantly lower than the decoupled architecture uh, again, this is because of the optimizations that we are doing and the fact that we never have to bring in the entire segment for query processing. All right, finally, let's look at uh, one last feature, which is our ability to do uh, handle uh, JSON, uh, semi-structured data, for example, nested JSON. So this is an example where one of your input columns, uh, let's say person has this nested JSON structure. And we want the ability to do queries or aggregations on, uh, for example, country, uh, nested country dimension. So all we need to do uh, in Pino is to define a JSON index uh, on the person column. With this index, uh, we can then go ahead and use the JSON match predicate in our queries, uh, which takes the JSON column and whatever filter expression we want. So for example, this query computes or, or uh, identifies all uh, people with name as Adam. Uh, in this query, we can um, figure out who uh, lives on uh, street number 112. And you can also do a combination of these queries. And just to show the power of the JSON index, we did the same query with and without the JSON index. Uh, in this case, we were using a UDF um, uh, in, in, uh, when we are not using the JSON index. As you can see, the JSON index is many, many orders of magnitude faster uh, than doing any kind of a UDF um, on, on this query. And, and this, uh, this makes it possible to do very fast uh, aggregations and, and other computation on semi-structured data without any pre-processing needed um, which, which greatly simplifies onboarding in, uh, for such use cases. All right, to wrap it up, uh, in this presentation, we saw Pino has been designed from the ground up for excellent query performance. Uh, it's able to handle mutations in your real-time input streams. Uh, it can easily ingest from a variety of data sources like streaming, uh, batch, or SQL. Uh, it has out-of-the-box support for handling semi-structured data using JSON or text index. Um, it also provides a hybrid architecture uh, for cost efficiency where you can have a lot, most of your data in a cloud storage. And it's really one platform which you can tune to build all these different kinds of use cases. Um, with, with, uh, this, this is really what makes Pino uh, an ideal fit. Uh, as the OLAP engine the world needs today. With that, I'll, I'll conclude my talk. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, and again, uh, as a customary slide, uh, Startree is hiring. So if you are interested, or if you have any questions on, uh, on, on this presentation, you can reach me at chinmay at startree.ai. Thank you so much. So we can now start with the question. Uh, if you have someone in the, in the room, do we have a question? <laughs> <laughs>
Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, so this afternoon, we, we I attended another talk here that was an Apache Druid, which seems to, to, to fit basically the same type of use case. What are what does uh, differentiate your products from uh, from Apache Druid? Yeah, um, yeah, good question. So one of the key things that Pino offers is the real time upsurge feature. Um, which I believe is either uh, maybe not fully ready or not there yet in, in Druid. And, and that's uh, important for some of the use cases that demand accurate queries. Um, and, and this is uh, one thing we saw in Uber, where even the business metrics had to be really accurate so that you can do uh, take this real-time decisions. And this impacted financial incentives or fraud and risk and all, all those things. So... Upsurge is one thing uh, I would call out. And then the uh, indexes, right? So the reason Pino uh, is meant for user-facing uh, analytics is because of the variety of indexes that we support, um, which uh, I mean, you can, we can go back in the presentation. But um, the, the, the key thing there is uh, it's also pluggable. So it's very easy to uh, keep adding uh, more indexes. So for example, the geo index and and some of the, uh, the the new range index was added within one or two weeks, which makes uh, overall not only is it already fast, but it's also keep, easy to keep adding more and more indexes as they come in. So I think those w would be my two main callouts. Do we have another question? Okay. All right. So uh, another question: um, uh, When you talked about uh, S3, so uh, moving moving some of the segments uh, onto S3, um, do you support upsert on, on on those data that is moved there, and how, and how do you decide uh, what data to move to S3? Yeah. Uh, good question. Uh, so. It definitely um, uh, does support upsurge. The way it works is, uh, as I mentioned, the segments are immutable. Um, so we we are moving uh, immutable data on onto S3. Uh, the only part which is mutable uh, is the the bitmaps that that we are generating uh, locally within the Pino servers. Uh, so in this case, the bitmaps uh, would still be local. On, on the Pino servers and the actual segment would be would be in S3. So every time uh, a query needs to process a particular segment which is sitting remotely, uh, it would first refer to the local bitmap and then decide uh, how it wants to uh, ignore certain rows within the remote, remote segment. Do we have another question? So I think uh, I think this time it's good. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for presenting uh, such a good um, conference. Um, I think we can just applaud you <laughs> first. Um, maybe we can just uh, thank our speaker. Thank you so much.